Yo, we are here live with Generation Progress, getting ready to talk about the Beyond Presidency campaign, Beyond the Presidency campaign. We've got folks joining now. Thanks for jumping in. We're going to go live here in just a second. Or we are live. We're going to jump into conversation with CC Battle in just a second. Uh, thanks for joining. I see folks jumping on now. I'm Brent Cohen, Executive Director here at GP. Thanks for being with us. And we're going to jump into conversation about uh, what it looks like to have power beyond the presidency and what we need to do to hold folks accountable at the local, state, and federal level. So uh, thanks for being on with us. We're going to be jumping into conversation here shortly. It looks like we've got people joining. Thanks. Thanks for jumping in. As I said, we'll be uh, starting conversation here in just a minute about the power that folks have, not just in the Oval Office, but across government, um, local, state, and federal. All right. Let's see here. We're going to go ahead and jump in. Hey, Cece. <laughs> hey, did it. How's, How's it going? going? It's going. I don't know about you. This week has been off the chain. I It, <laughs> it took a lot for me to put on real clothes right now. Um, I feel like th this week has been off the chain. I mean, excuse me, this week, this year has been off the chain. Uh, all 2020 of that. has been something else. All of that. All of that. Thank you so much for having me. Excited. Hello to everyone that's joining. So good okay. to see y'all. Of course. Thanks for doing this with us, CC. Yeah. Um, so we've got, I see the numbers ticking up there. So happy to have folks joining us to talk about uh, Jim Progress's new Beyond the, the Presidency campaign, the power that folks have across government, and the work that CC has been doing in this space for literally the last decade to, to get folks' attention, not just, uh, not just focused on the Oval Office, not just focused on federal elections. Um, but really talking about the power that people have and that officials have all across local, state, and federal government. So let's just go ahead and jump in. I know we only have 30 minutes for the conversation and, and, and want to get all of your brilliance out onto the table while we can. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, GP launched Beyond the Presidency campaign um, with a big push around secretaries of state, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a minute. But really just to bring attention to the fact that um, local officials in particular, but state officials and, 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 and some federal officials that don't sit in the White House have immense power. Oh, um, yeah. And it's power that, that impacts our communities in a really acute way, in a, in a really personal way. Um, and so uh, we want to bring attention to the fact that we need our advocacy and, and, and voting focus on that, too. And, you know, for me, this this stemmed, I've shared with you before, Cece, this stemmed with me uh, a couple of years back when I was working with folks um, who have been directly impacted by the justice system and talking about the importance of voting as one tool and part of the advocacy work that they were doing. Um, but when you're talking about the the, Fed, the presidential election, it kind of, kind of feels uh, too distant, right? Like, yeah. It may or may not really matter, but when I started talking about local prosecutors, folks were jumping out of their seats and saying, that dude gave me X number of years, they prosecuted my brother like this, they could have done this instead. In local prosecution races, a DA race can come down to 10, 15, 25 votes, 150 Absolutely. votes. Yeah. So you've been, you've been a leader in this space, <laughs> specifically this space, not just the democracy space, but like this space for a decade. Yeah. Uh, when when did you get this idea? When did you launch it? What like what is it? Tell us tell us the work you've been doing here since twenty ten. Yeah, and for folks who don't know me, hey, my name is Cece, she her hers. I'm the current executive director of Young People Four, and we're a national social justice incubator that serves black, brown, indigenous, LGBTQIA, and differently able young folks in all fifty states and territories. We've been doing this for sixteen years and our folks serve twenty one hundred young folks across the country. So just so you understand who I currently serve a little bit about me, but how I got started really talking about the power of the seat, funny enough, had to do with Young People Four. So one of the, the parts of our work is a year-long fellowship program. 
And what we do is work with young folks who are pissed off about things, but maybe don't have the language or resources or opportunities to really make it pop. And that was me over a decade ago. I am still young. Britt and I talk about this. We are young-ish, okay? So don't come for me. Um, shout out to all the young people. We see you. We feel you. Um, but at the time, I'm from Florida. I'm from Miami. If any Miami folks are on the live, what's up? And Florida is the wild, wild west. Everything is wild in Florida. And what I found out, I was going to school at FIU at the time, and there was a gubernatorial race, to your point about things feeling really distant. The gubernatorial race felt very distant for folks. So nobody was engaged, even though they felt some type of way about the current governor, no one really paid attention to that. And I was confused as to why folks didn't care about local elections. Right. Interestingly enough, at that time, the mayor was the husband of my dance teacher from high school. And I remember having conversations with him, like going up there um, and talking about the different things that his job did. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, I don't think a lot of people know this. Right. So what I did at the time, I was student body president and I said, I don't think that young people aren't educated or don't know that this is important, but it's strategic that we don't understand or know who controls what. So at the time I brought on campus, his name was Mayor Pierre, but also at the time the city manager, his name was Russell Benefer. He's actually like a CEO of a cruise line right now, which is really wild. Um, But he came on campus and did something transformational, which, which set the stage of this work which was, he said, you know, as the city manager, I control if your trash is picked up on time, I control, you know, what this looks like, what that looks like, but more importantly, I control property taxes. And he was, everyone was like, we don't own a house for young people, like we're students. But he said, this was the kicker, depending on how high property taxes are directly correlate to how high your dorm fees are game changer and people were like whoa whoa wait 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 what and i realized in that moment because then folks started asking follow-up questions folks started to ask well how did you get there are you elected are you appointed and i realized that when you are able to connect not only to the to the issue but the micro issue it one helps people see outside of of who the current person is but they understand the connection between something that affects my day-to-day life, but also the power of the seat who controls it. And the second thing that's really important is it provides an entryway into this political web. What folks need to understand is the reason why things feel so disconnected, it's intentional. They say political science for a reason. It is intentional that we don't understand it inherently. It's, It's created in a way that it's confusing and it has twists and turns and that builds off of each other. And for me, what I found by teaching people the power of the seat, it allows us to take our power back because the candidates will change, but the power of the seat won't change. So if we're able to educate folks on stuff that stays, that remains the same, we're able to build power outside of the temperamental way that they strategically want us to participate in elections, which is, oh, this Billy Bob, vote for Billy Bob. Isn't he so cool? You know, he like drinks great beer. Don't you want to have a beer with him? Or like his kids go to your school or don't you feel inspired by him? All of these things that will change. Mm -hmm. If we're able to connect folks to say, oh, okay, what are you really pissed about? Connect it to the seat that does that. It's going to make you ask questions like, how do you get there? Who controls that? Who do you work with, et cetera? So that, that's kind of how I got started. And then it moved on to other issues like, why can't we turn up till six o'clock in the morning? Well, we can't turn up till six o'clock in the morning because the city council passed a noise ordinance. And what we right. saw 10 years ago was it created real organizing points. Like we changed that. So funny enough, when, he, when they came on campus, and I think maybe this is the reason why they wanted to come on campus, there was a local election happening about a month later. And we increased participation in a month by 15%, in a month. And if you go now to my campus, there are certain seats that students don't play about. 
And it's because they understand the power of the seat. So that's how I got started and would love if we have time to talk about how that work has informed, you know, young people for his work over the last four years and, and just drop some more gems. Cause this is where it's at y'all. We all need to be talking about the power of the seat. So I'm so excited about you all launching this campaign. It's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. No, it is, it's awesome to hear you talk about the, the immediate impact that you had right on FIU's campus, right in the city where you were, increasing youth voter turnout by 15 percent in a month it's because when it's tangible when it's real right when when we're able to connect the dots on the issues that people care about and also like it if you get 10 people to vote and they get 10 people to vote literally you can change you can turn a local election in seconds right i mean we saw there was a city council race in boston boston is not a tiny city Uh, a city council race in boston that uh came down to one vote before recount one vote Wild. It's just it's just a different process um, than when you're talking about a presidential election, which is still hugely important, and people should vote, especially in Florida. Um, but you know, like there's there's an electoral college, and there's a process to go through, and there's millions of people voting. When we're talking about city council or um, or the mayor or uh, some of these other local positions, it can be literally a handful of votes, twenty, thirty votes, less than that, that determines. Yeah. Um, how this happened, sort of just going back to the DA example, the district attorney example for a quick second, and then I want to hear about how how this has informed YP4's approach um, during your tenure, uh, you know, uh, under under your leadership. But the district attorney example for a second, in Queens, New York, um, the, the, the district attorney's race came down to 15 votes at one point. Yeah. Queens. If Queens were its own city, it would be the fourth largest city in America. That's wild. It would be the fourth largest city, and 15 votes decided the Queens DA race. It eventually went to a runoff and or a recount and all that other stuff, but 15 votes, and the district attorney plays a leading role in determining who gets prosecuted, a leading role in determining uh, what level to prosecute somebody at. They can... Um, they can't change state legislation by themselves, but they can decide not to bring charges for certain cases. Exactly. Right. So there's just such enormous power in that position. Um, and you know, it, it can be, it can be influenced and impacted and we can hold as young people, folks in those positions accountable because our vote counts so much there. Absolutely. So, so Cece, how have you used this? How have you used this framing that you developed in your work? Yeah. So before I got to YP4, I, we actually use the framing to work with candidates. And the reason why that's important is one of the things we should all know, and and Brittany did a great job of just letting us know how, how, how a lot of these elections come to very close margins. And I say that to, to, to illuminate, to say voting is a collective act. And a lot of times it's that conflict of like mainstream culture tells us to center ourselves in individualism but inherently voting you need to center yourselves in collectivism because yes individual votes do matter and do count but power is in community right so what i used to use it as was a way to talk to candidates in terms of it's great that you want to get elected but what's really important is that you're building up the collectivism of the constituency that you aim to serve because your job as an elected official is not just to get elected and reelected. Your job as an elected official is to represent people and to give as much power to the people. And you give power to people by helping them understand a system that was not made for most of us. And how you do that is by exposing the powers of the seats that you're either running for, that you need to work with, et cetera. Recently, an example of that, I did a a panel with a Black Professionals Network, shout out BPN, gang, gang, gang. Um, And I was interviewing elected officials and what I, well, candidates at the time. And I asked them, what what does your seat do? What does your seat do? And that is really important, y'all, because we have been strategically conditioned that we can't run for office because we don't have certain skills. But in fact, most of us, all of us, all y'all on this call, for sure you, homie, and me, we all have the skills to be in certain elected office, but we don't know that because we don't understand what they do. So part of that, when I was interviewing them, I'm like, what do they do? Tell me about yourself and make those connections, right? 
but also what other seats do you need to be successful? And that's important for us because we need to know that if we're trying to organize people, lobby posts, because oftentimes we're organizing the wrong people who actually don't have that power. And they're able to just look and be like, oh, I wish I could do more and give us some sexy talking points. But it's actually not the people who control what we need to do. And I'll give you some examples of that. But what the work has looked like at Young People For, which I'm so proud of, shout out to Andrea and Haley and Katie and Harper and Gabe, gang, gang, gang. Um, Over the last four years, we launched a campaign um, under Andrea's leadership specifically because she was a visionary behind, you know, building this campaign around how do we provide free civic engagement trainings across the country using passion framing. And what we found, passion framing is the method that I created, where you start with the end back to the power of the seat and then ask folks to commit. And we have trained folks in about 41 states and territories over the last three years using this framework. And it's been really great because we've been able to train super young folks, super older folks, everyone in the middle. And what they found was not only could they use it, you know, for whatever organizing tactics that they were trying to do, but the core thing, building power to win, it builds long-term power. Because again, the candidate will change, but the power of that damn seat will not. And when you know what the seat does, inherently you're going to care who's in it or what type of person is in it. So an example of, of what that looked like is, Let's let's look at what we're looking at now. And I know we're going to talk about soon elected and unelected positions. But oftentimes when there are wild police shootings and all of these police folks are acting a fool, a lot of times we think the sheriff. Let's name the sheriff. Usually in a lot of these municipalities are elected officials, but we're not talking about police unions. Police unions, you need to understand what both of those things do how they get there so we can apply pressure correctly, right? Because sometimes we put a lot of pressure on the sheriff, but the police unions, they get to do their thing. Or we put a lot of pressure on our city police um, agency or government, police and government, but not the county. And the counties are usually the folks who are so rooted in racism, they can't see their left from their right. So what we have to understand by really understanding the power of the seat, it's not just about, oh, educating about something different, but it gives us as the people, as the people, the information we need to move people the way they need it to be moved. Because we need to understand, y'all, these elected officials are our tools. And the reason why they've been able to use the tools to build their own power is because we haven't had the information we need to move them accordingly. So don't get me hot because I get (laughs) I get real hot talking about this. Okay, you know, and when 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 I hear you talking about the county CC, I'm also thinking about county executives who, in most places, are running local jails. Come on, right? So as we talk about tell them about about mass incarceration, as we're talking about folks cycling in and out of jails, that's the county. That's the county executive who is making some of those decisions. They're also determining what the conditions look like when someone goes into jail. Is it safe? Is it not safe? Is it incredibly toxic and harmful and traumatic as most of these places are? Yes. And oftentimes it's the county executive or the, or the sheriff, depending on where you are, who is running that jail. And that is a, a, a largely a local position where they need to respond to constituents and we need yep. to be holding them accountable for yeah. what they're doing. And also the mayor. The mayor controls a lot of these contracts. And one of the things that we don't really put pressure on is the mayor whether they're a strong mayor or not whether they have voting power or not they still have specific influence especially as regards to funds do y'all know how much taxes we pay okay in dc they take all our money everything in florida you know we be with the taxes but nonetheless there is so much money in taxes that our cities have that our counties have that our elected officials are responsible for and they use them in a way to uphold power for them well and that's why i think the you know the the conversation happening right now about reducing police budgets is so incredibly important because we know if there's only a set amount of money 
and X percent in a lot of places is 25 percent is going to yep. the police department. That means we're not investing in the type of long term community stability and safety that we need. Uh, we're not addressing educational inequities. We're not addressing uh, the harms of redlining and housing insecurity and home ownership disparities that we know have existed because of structural racism. We're not addressing um, other, you know, long term interventions that really a lot of communities enjoy by de facto sort of situation right now. We're not investing in those in part because we're investing in in law enforcement entities. So it's a, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but your your budget as a city determines your values or at least Absolutely. shows your values. Yeah, and the mayor and the city council largely determines where that money is going. Yeah, and what so, we don't, you know, again, I want to stress every city and every county is different depending on where you are. Right. But want to name that it is strategically confusing and it's confusing so that we don't know who controls what so that we don't hold people accountable. What Britt is also illuminating for us is that each of these different municipalities, just like federal governments, have different departments, right? So that control different things like your housing regulations, you know, your parks, your rec, all of those things are financed by tax dollars. So if you are trying to figure out, oh, well, you know, why is my police in, but why do I see a, a police car on every corner, but I barely see a patch of grass? All of that is local. And the key for us as organizers, as people who are trying to make better communities, not just for ourselves, but for the people that come after us, is we have to do the research to understand the power of these seats, y'all. Because what they try to do is do this, right? I, and I'll give you an example of this. And, and this is my dance for distraction. Get into it. <laughs> So if we think about, regardless of the presidential party, think about all of the different debates that you saw on the main stage. And you see these presidential candidates talking about these things. That is a distraction. Most of the president's job, they cannot control the stuff that they talk about. That's it right. is actually, they control them by the folks that they appoint, whether it be judges who serve lifetime appointments or whether it be the agency heads that they then appoint, right? Imagine if we knew Oh, okay, when we're voting for a president, what we're actually voting for is the best spokesperson and the best coach. Because this person's job is to staff folks. That is what they're supposed to do. And imagine if we looked at them from the perspective of, I know your scope of work. If y'all apply for a job, right? If you're interviewing people, you're not interviewing them on like, oh, well, I draw great pictures. and they're No, you're an accountant, sis. I want to know what your numbers are. What's your budget look like? Right. So imagine the way that we can hold folks accountable for the long term if we really understand fundamentally what they do and we don't allow them to distract us by pomp and circumstance because we know the bottom line. So that's right. That's and, and you and I have both worked in local government. We yeah. both worked in government. We understand that just as you were saying, the incredible power that agency heads have, whether it's at the local level or at the federal yes. level. And those folks are appointed by whomever is elected for that executive role. And so just, you know, incredibly important to think about it in the way that you just said. Who are they going to put in positions of power to actually carry out the missions and to actually do the work of either serving or not serving the people who put them there? So one, you know, I want to plug one example that, that we pushed out here from Generation Progress, which is a, a toolkit around secretaries of state. In 38 places around the country, secretaries of state are the chief election official, which means they are the ones charged with and responsible for delivering mm. free, fair, inclusive elections. Yes. This has been an issue throughout the country's history, as we all well know. It's um, particularly profound right now in modern history, yeah. uh, given, given concerns around the COVID-19 pandemic and other deliberate attempts at voter suppression. And so there are 13 secretaries, of, excuse me, 38 secretaries of state who are the chief election official across the country who are important, who are uh, have the important role of implementing those elections at the state level. And that's something who who very frequently is um, is not known. But people are going to use that as a stepping stone to go run for something else. And so knowing the power of that seat and knowing who's in that seat is really important. Um, Georgia. I, I mean, let's just, so the current governor of Georgia held that position 
That's right. While a little bit, well, during and, you know, a little bit after he was running against Stacey Abrams. So I think you're pointing out a huge point. And speaking of Georgia, one of the things that we did at Young People for is, I don't know if y'all saw, but I saw some folks saying, where can we get plugged in? We did a civic engagement training series that broke down local government, state government, federal government, all the way up to international governance to make those connections. And we used Georgia as a case study for that specific reason. So I know some of the folks on the team are watching right now. They'll drop, they'll drop the, the chat, drop in the chat, the training series. But also we had a free civic engagement summit that Jim Progress turned up at. And if you all are trying to figure out like, where do I start? Like, how do I get to know the nuances of my local government, of the state government, of the federal government? Watch our trainings, they're free. Use them as an organizing tactic. But most importantly, jo join Jim, Jim Progress's campaign, y'all. Like we, I think that you all can see in the world that we live in, that folks are using this pandemic in time as a point to consolidate power, right? It is very clear that certain folks are having better outcomes and other folks are having worse outcomes. How we can circumvent that is we can arm ourselves with information that will transcend what's happening. And how we do that is not just focusing on the candidate, but it's really focusing on the power of the seat. Because in 2016, and this is some you know of the data that we pulled, the number one reason why young folks did not participate in 2016 is they didn't like the candidates. And what we know for sure, y'all, that even with an inaction, like some folks chose not to vote for whatever reason, but there was still a reaction. And that reaction is the reality that we're living in now. So I would challenge us that we are in 2020 and we could argue that we feel the same exact way about the candidates. But imagine if we can participate in a different way with information that can transcend candidates, which is really understanding what the heck that they're doing. And there are tons of roles that if you're considering like, which one should I really care about? Definitely start local. Yo, local elections, all of these, your day-to-day -day life, are your lights coming on? Are they flickering? Do they come and fix them real quick? Is there a pothole? You know, why don't you have any grocery stores on your street? Where the grass at, homie? Why, why do I only see, you know, white girls walking their dogs on certain certain things? It's gentrification over here. I can't pay my rent. All of those things are controlled locally, but they're also impacted by, you know, gentrification and all of those things. Resources are impacted on the state and local level. We're in the middle of a census that controls a whole lot of money for us, right? And it all goes back to who controls that. So listen, power of the seat, yp4.org, what's up, gym progress, make it pop. Like, come on, just, just see, see, I feel like got, we need a part two of this. Like, you got me so taking like, notes over here. I had to pick up a pen to start writing down things because you're teaching me stuff. So fill out your census. I heard that from CC loud and clear. If you haven't already, fill out the census. It determines how money gets allocated, how resources get allocated for the next 10 years, political power gets allocated for the next 10 years. Um, and for sure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to plug your, your handle, YP4's handle, your website one more time. And then uh, I'm going to plug GP's handle and, 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 uh, and website, and we'll let folks get on with their day. But um, Cece, where, where can folks find out more information about you and YP4? Yes. So Young People 4 always first, first and foremost, because all the things on there are free ski. So youngpeople4.org. And also on our YouTube, youngpeople4.org, all of the trainings are there. They're free and open to the public. Also on social media, Young People 4 on Instagram and Twitter and on Facebook. Um, for me, I'm the T-H-E-C-C -C Battle, um, or you can just click. I'm, I mean, I'm on here. Feel free to follow me. Happy to do that. Um, but for real, the, the last thing that I will say, not only this election, it's about putting this election into context. And we have to, y'all, we not only do we have to show up, but we have to build power as we're showing up to make sure that we show up from now moving on. What we know for sure is either we are going to take power for our communities or we're going to give power to other communities. And the core, the core of really trying to build power is educating people on the power of the seat, y'all. So I encourage you all follow our trainings at Young People Four. But please get involved in Jim Progress's campaign. Get your life together. Mobilize the people. <laughs> please. Thank you, Cece. And you can find out more about the work that we're doing 
you can go to genprogress.org. That's genprogress.org, and you'll see right there the Beyond the Presidency work that we're doing uh, focused on power outside of the Oval Office, the work we're doing on Secretaries of State. Um, if you haven't registered to vote yet, you can go to genprogress.org slash vote. That's genprogress.org slash vote. And just my heartfelt thanks, Cece, to you for joining us to talk about the work you've been doing for the last 10 years, the work you continue to do, uh, and just appreciate your leadership in this space. So thank you, Cece, for joining us today. Thank you, friend. And if you want to do this again, and listen, let me know. I will talk about oh. the power of the city all day, okay? All day. <laughs> thank y'all Don't get mad when I keep texting you to do IG Lives with me. Happy, happy to. I'm talk I'm happy to talk all the shit because we need everybody. Like it's real out here. So thank you so much for having me and follow young people for y'all. Love y'all. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye.